So we look to see if there's scuffles, if uh, police are rushing towards something, and and when we see that, we'll move. Uh, other times, it's a lot easier just to sit and hang out near where the police officers are because they'll take us to the action. And so in this instant, uh, instance, Sergeant Randy Deer and uh, a good number of his subordinates have been extremely antagonistic towards cop watchers, and so we just figured we'd stay right there and let the action come to us. So if I'm telling this narrative and I want to say, like, this happened, this happened, yeah. this happened, where does it all start, would you say, that night? I mean, well, it didn't start that night. It started January 1st, 2012, sure. and it's been an ongoing, uh, you know, saga ever right. since. because you already knew this story. Well, I, I didn't personally know him. I know that he's, he's pushed me before, he's shoved me before, he's given me false orders before, but he's actually done a lot worse than some of the Eric Cop watchers. He has been extremely aggressive to Julian Reyes, who had his dog Shinerbach killed by Austin police. Uh, he's been extremely aggressive towards Joshua Pineda, who had his head bashed open by uh, DPS. Um, he's been very aggressive towards numerous cop watchers, and, and he's the He's a senior ranking official in his little squad, and a lot of his subordinates mimic his activity. It's just a complete uh, breakdown of, of uh, leadership and uh, professionalism within that squad. And unfortunately, you know, I, I reached out to a lieutenant last night before this whole thing blew up, and I said, this guy's violating our constitutional rights. It'd be great if you would pull him aside and do some professional development with him, but uh, apparently that didn't happen. And so this, this Sergeant Randy, Deer. 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 Uh, he, uh, Does anyone know his badge number? Yeah, I It's on the business card that got posted. Like yeah. Four, 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 Oh, well, my first conflict with him was another night when he right. came up and just started pushing me. Out uh, yeah, yeah. Last night, last night the, we walked by him at one point and he said something to the effect of, I hope you guys are, are going to have a good night. And I said, as long as you guys don't violate our rights, you will. And then the next time I had an interaction with him was um, that little, where they were, um, some, some, um, I don't know what some sort of protester out there. Some, someone who had a, an issue that they cared about was out there, and they were talking to an Austin police officer just about what they could and couldn't do. And you don't know what the protester was protesting? Uh, it, it was some sort of religious thing. Okay. Yeah. Um, but, but he wasn't detained. It was completely voluntary. He actually went up to the top to talk to him. Um, so there was, there was not even uh, a detention or arrest in progress. And I'm just filming just to, like we do, we, we film police interactions. And then uh, Sergeant Deer just started following me around, and I just kept moving away from him as he kept threatening to arrest me. And then I asked him uh, after after the fact about the First Amendment to the Constitution, and he knew what that was. And hey, you can't arrest us just for being out here. We have a right to be here. And then, um, and then uh, it escalated. Uh, yeah, because I see like you guys having kind of an exchange in the video, and then he starts like doing this or this or something. Yeah, well, it wasn't Turn an exchange. Around. <laughs> you yeah. know, it was like he came up to me. It's like, yeah. I wasn't going out, out of my way saying, hey, Sergeant Deer, buddy, what's up? Let's mm -hmm. talk. Like, he, it was, he was the one that was, that was aggressive. Okay. Yeah. Do you remember the last thing he said to you before he arrested you, Ryan? Um, I'm pretty sure the video uh, will be pretty definitive. But uh, yeah, I can't hear him in the yeah, video. He said something silly like, we are about to start our patrol, and you're standing right where we're going to patrol, so you need to move. And I was like, well, okay, um, you can always go around me or something. But then I moved, and then he arrested me anyway. So, uh, so I don't know. I, I'm sure the video will be more descriptive. I've just spent 18 yeah. hours. So. And, and by the way, I always ask people, you know, what was your experience in there in the jail? Yeah, well, I mean, it's been, I, I think that everyone should go to jail at some point um, <laughs> because it's a really eye-opening experience. Mm -hmm. um, you know, the, the institution itself is pretty inhumane. Um, uh, to be fair, the sheriff's deputies were were not uh, were not mean, but um, you know you're you're in there, you're by yourself for 18 hours. You can't read anything, you can't talk to anyone. It's cold. But I looked out the front 
the little tiny window on my cell twice uh, during the night. And the first time I looked out, I saw six uh, young black men out there, and they were using the phone. And the next time I looked out, I saw five Hispanic men and one quite obviously extremely poor white person. And I think that when you're in the jail, you realize that most often the people that are in the jail are the people that have no power and have no voice, they have no political power, they have no um, economic power. And the people who uh, support the status quo and what the police are doing are you know, the people like the real estate developers that have controlled the city council and the mayor, you know, the, the police union that controls uh, the city council and the mayor, um, you know, and, and you know, they're invisible. Everyone inside this building is invisible and they're predominantly people of color, predominantly people who are poor, uh, the homeless, the mentally ill, um, and no one's fighting for them. And it's really, it's really sad, and I think that it would be nice if more people could just go inside and see what it's like to realize how unjust uh, the system is, and how police, uh, they can arbitrarily uh, and unlawfully arrest me to punish me for exercising my First Amendment rights. But when I come out, I have the Peaceful Streets uh, Project here waiting for me. Um, you know, I have a great lawyer who's going to fight for me to make sure I don't get uh, convicted of crimes I didn't commit, but those people in there, they don't get that. You know, everyone just assumes that they're guilty. Uh, police abuse them. Uh, they punish them by arresting them and charging them with crimes that they didn't commit. And ultimately, um, you know, they, they go down with convictions and they lose jobs. You know, they, they can't get their car out of the lot because it's been impounded and they can't pay the 300 bucks to get it out. So then they lose their, then they lose their job. They potentially lose their home. And it, it creates a pretty vicious cycle. And, and that's, that's what we have here in the United States. We have a criminal justice system that is really intended to keep people down and to, to really punish people, uh, not really to protect people. Is it a normal thing? Uh, like every Saturday night, you guys go out and film? Not stuff? every Saturday night. It's like sometimes we'll go out multiple nights. Um, you know, there's some people like Richard and Julian who are out quite often. Yeah, so, um, but last night was our first publicly organized cop watch in a while. Usually we just have an internal email list and we send out the emails um, so that APD doesn't know what's going on, but last night was a, a public one. Okay, so maybe like once a month, once every couple months? No, we, we definitely cop watch more than that. Okay. Yeah. Thank you I'll so let much. you go yeah. home now. Yeah, I go home. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. Media guys, do me a favor, please uh, Please 